All right, let's kick things off here, folks. It's 6.02, Tuesday evening in beautiful, if a bit rainy, Ubud, Bali. I think it's raining out there. Is it raining out there? A little bit. The rains have come to Bali, but it's still nice in the morning. Um, it's Tuesday evening, uh, 6 p.m. local time. It's time for Bitcoin Filter. We've got a good show lined up for you guys tonight. Um, uh, let's see. We're going to talk about the price. We always do. Uh, and the price is a little bit exciting yeah. this time. It's slightly exciting. It's slightly up and slightly exciting. Um, but we've got a little bit of blockchain analysis on the price. Well, I think it has to do with the price, but we'll see what you guys think. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the CFTC and the regulation of commodities. They've gotten in the game and uh, some people think it's a good thing, some people think it's a bad thing. We've had a few scandals in the cryptocurrency world of late. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's a mixed bag, a double-edged sword. Uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, we've got some movements of gold, international movements of gold, which I think are a commentary on the global financial system. We'll, we'll hit the macroeconomics a little bit uh, and talk about... Uh, the repatriation of gold uh, in Germany and now the Netherlands. Uh, it's a, a real interesting development in the, the global world of money. Um, we'll also see some commentary from David Cameron on the global economy, which uh, um, he even mentions what we've got going on here in Bali um, because it's so influential, these meetings we have on Tuesday evenings. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, the world is noticing it. It's nice to have David on board. Uh, hello, David. Anyway, um, the topic for tonight, I'm going to lead a little discussion around identity. Uh, it seems like a, a, a simple, straightforward thing. Uh, let's see your, uh, your identification. But it's actually quite complicated. And I think for everybody, whether they want to identify themselves or not, is, well, it seems to me it should be a personal choice, but these days I think uh, a lot of times we don't realize the compromise we're making with our own identity. Uh, also going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, anonymity, and identity, uh, some things you may or may not know. So stick around, we've got a great show. Uh, let's go ahead and kick things off. Let me just share my screen here. So people aren't looking at me any longer. They can look at this nice screen. Uh, this is the Bitcoins in Bali group. This is how it works. We have an ongoing conversation here. Uh, if you find an interesting story on the internet, then it would be great if you would post it here and we can discuss it in the comments. And then when we get together on Tuesday night, we can discuss it in person. So uh, there's a really vibrant community here posting things uh, pretty much every day, two or three interesting items. So check it out in between time, and on Tuesday night, come into Hubud and uh, join us for the, the live version. That's what we're doing right now. Um, let's see, local announcements. Um, this past Friday, we had the cocktails at sunset. It was a great event at the Viceroy Bali. We had 56 bills paid with, with Bitcoin, so somebody ordered a drink and paid with Bitcoin, and rinse and repeat 56 times uh, successfully. Um, needless to say, by the end of the evening, there was lots of jocularity and good fun. I think everybody had a good time. Thanks to all of you who came out. I think uh, it was a big success. Our own uh, Ivor Kondrick of Hubud won the prize, uh, romantic dinner for two, uh, at Cascades, which is the restaurant advice, right? So we'll have, to, we'll have to get the scoop from him uh, after he does that. Uh, anyway, that was really fun. Uh, Upcoming is the Bitcoin 101, happens December 6th. If you have any friends that know absolutely nothing about Bitcoin, please send them our way. We'll, uh, um, we will greet them uh, and teach them all about Bitcoin and they'll actually leave with a working Bitcoin wallet and a little bit of Bitcoin so that they can go uh, spend it at all the local vendors that accept Bitcoin here in the uh, Bitcoin center of the universe, at least in Asia. That's uh, Ubud Bali, for those who don't know. Uh, December 6th, Saturday. Check it out. 
Okay, uh, December 13th, we've got the Bitcoin Film Festival. I don't know if you can see over here on the right, we've got, we're keeping some good company here. They're showing this film festival in Berlin, in Seoul, Buenos Aires, Budapest, and there we are right there, Ubud, Bali. In just a few weeks, we're going to host the Bitcoin Film Festival right here at the Paradiso Theater, which is the largest theater in all of Ubud. It's not very large, but it is the largest. Um, I'm hoping we can jam 200 people up in there. Um, we may have to sit on each other's laps. So uh, yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, that's December 13th. Next on the agenda is a revamp of the Bit Islands website. It's actually a, a really nice looking website here. Uh, this is Bit Islands, for those who don't remember, is the social experiment underway here in Bali to make Bali a Bitcoin-friendly destination. So what we're trying to do is encourage uh, Bitcoin education and Bitcoin adoption amongst end users and merchants. And uh, we've got, got a much nicer looking direct, directory here. Um, you can see we've got, uh, there's the Viceroy, which we were at before, some surfing lessons, uh, jewelry shops, um, language lessons, you name it, they're all here. But one thing that's cool about the new directory is it plots things on a map. So you can see where the uh, actual location is for, for each of these things. So kind of cool. Check out bitislands.com and, uh, and, the, and the new link. Cool. By the way, the uh, Living Food Lab said they're interested in accepting it. I was talking, I was like, I heard Bitcoin. They just didn't really know anything about it or how to do it. So uh -huh. that might be another thing to. Yeah, I've, uh, um, I would love to see that happen. Uh, uh, Living Food Lab is the cafe here at Hubud. And uh, if, if we could spend our Bitcoin to buy lunch, that would be fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, let's do it. Well. Let's just wrestle them to the ground and make yeah. them take Bitcoin. Yeah. We'll like force it upon them. I've, I've had some conversations about it. But uh, anyway, there's some mitigating circumstances there. I'll, I'll fill you guys in later. Edmund, welcome. Hello. OK, on a somber note, this week we lost Clear Cafe. Uh, there was a, an electrical fire, and Clear Cafe burned to the ground. This was one of the um, one of the first merchants to accept Bitcoin, a, a little cafe in downtown Ubud, and uh, they are act, they've actually already started rebuilding. Um, but it's a quite quite a hardship for all the people that work there, and uh, I think the businesses nearby were even affected by the electrical grid uh, out of business business for at least a few days. Uh, Clear Cafe will be down for uh, at least a month, maybe more. But they have begun rebuilding. And uh, anyway, our, our thoughts are with these guys as they uh, put, put their business back together. Edmund? They have a banner outside that school for donations, but they didn't include their big comment. Oh, they didn't? They just scanned it and sent it to ah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I have their Bitcoin address. I actually know what it is. So maybe uh, at, at next week's meeting, I'll put it up. And we'll uh, yeah. maybe on the spot we'll we'll uh, suddenly do a map race. Yeah. Yes, we'll we'll. That's a great yeah. idea. I think we should do that next week. Okay. Maybe you want to check with them so that it goes to the right place. Like, uh, maybe yeah. yes. <laughs> because I noticed that they sweep their their gas uh, every every day. Yes, yes. Well, that's because they use the um, that they have a service that remits all of their funds to Rupia. Yeah. And so uh, those funds, the bitcoins, get sold on the Indonesian exchange and then converted to rupiah. So that happens automatically. But it is a good idea to check with them to make sure that they still have control over that address. I suspect they do, but uh, we can probably get that done over the next week, and we'll do we'll do a little uh, Bitcoin airdrop next Tuesday night if we can remember. Yeah. Help me remember, guys. Um, okay, so that's it for local news. Any other local announcements that I forgot? Okay, I think I got them all. Let's talk about Bitcoin price. Last week, I think we were at like 388, 387, so not a lot of movement, although I think it's been up and down over the course of that the, this week. Um, today, the 24-hour price is up 5%. But yeah, we're hovering right below $400, 400 US dollars. I don't know if that's some sort of psychological barrier or what. Um, but it's nice to see that things going up. We had such a, a long period of, of a downward trend, and it feels like we're on a 
we're on an, an upward trend. But um, who knows? Um, we we see, seem to be a little bit boring, but a, a, a little bit positive this week on the price. In terms of Indonesian rupiah, we're at uh, last price of 4,700,000 uh, IDR to, the, uh, to a single Bitcoin. That's on the bitcoin.co.id exchange. Take a look at market cap. All right. $5,273,000,000 is what all of the Bitcoins in existence are worth in total. Um, interestingly enough, this market cap is a little bit lower than last week's market cap. However, the price per Bitcoin is up. Anybody understand what, or have any clues as to why that might be? Proof of burn. Proof of burn? Hmm. Do you think the Do you think the uh, the bitcoins that are known to be burned are removed from this index? It's an interesting question. So. Yeah, that's possible. Are there economies expanding? Um, say a little more. Like some will print off more money, and their my understanding is that like the U.S., for example, print off more money, or a bunch of other countries print off more money, and their rank would feel higher, correct? Well, we we are we are. Um, measuring against the US dollar and the US dollar supply is not known so that is an interesting theory yes if uh, if there was twice as many US dollars between last week or, or some difference in the supply of US dollars between last week and this week um, that could possibly change the market cap so it's not known but that other graph you from share I thought that was something that's uh, well that's the M1 money supply which is uh, coins and notes However, the, the actual uh, supply of U.S. dollars is quite lo a lot larger than that. I actually thought that last chart was the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. I'm not really sure. <laughs> the, the, um, the, the money supply graph that I show from oh, time to time, oh, okay. it's the, that's the base money supply, M1 money supply, the, um, the, the coins and notes, um, which is loaned out at a 9 to 1 ratio over and above what you see there. And, um, well, with the Bitcoin thing now, we printed a bunch of Bitcoin this week. Is that what it is? <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's it, Griff. You got it. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Bitcoin does have an inflation rate. It's it's a known rate. Every ten minutes, twenty five new baby Bitcoins are born, and uh, over the course of a week, uh, that adds up to a few, and that can also account for the higher per Bitcoin price but lower total market cap. So anyway, kind of an interesting uh, relationship there. Stamen? Well, if you get more Bitcoins in one week, if you multiply them by the price, so this market cap should be bigger than last Well, if, you, if you've got, if you got more Bitcoins with the same number of dollars, then the, the, the price will go down, right? Because it's uh, infl inflating the, the, number, the total number um, divided by a... a this, uh, this, uh, you get this number by multiplying the number of bitcoins by the current price, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, in the last week, we get 2,600 per day, so like 20,000 more bitcoins. So, it up and the price is higher per bitcoin, so this is higher. Uh huh. Hmm. Yeah, of course. Right. Let's see. I don't know. What did we get last week? 98 or 97? We had, uh, let me check here. Last week, bear with me. I write this down every week. Uh, last week, the price was 389.79 with a market cap, according to this source, of 5,302,000,000. Right, so, so the, oh wait, so. No, no, one thing is wrong. So, so last, last year, the, or last week, the price was 389, but the market cap was 5.3 billion. Now the price is 392 or thereabouts. And the market cap is five point two billion. Yeah, that's, that's, that's weird. That's, yeah. So Who knows what they're doing. You know? like, huh. Maybe their price is wrong. Like maybe it's a delay in the price, yeah. or they that. Uh, it should it should be a um, a pretty straight up calculation, right? You're right, Stamen. It should be the the number of bitcoins outstanding times the the dollar price. If the dollar price is higher, then you should have a higher market cap, right? But the price can be calculated in different ways because it depends on the, the exchange that you take the price from. 
Mm -hmm. Or if you take the wage average. Well, presumably these guys use the same source for the price, unless over the over the last week they changed where they're sourcing their price. Or maybe mm -hmm. they went from a weighted uh, weighted one to uh, a specific exchange or the other way around. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. I think that deserves a little bit more uh, investigation. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe we should start using a different source for the market cap. If uh, uh, it seems that this, well, at least if you look at the last two weeks, it's a uh, a little bit puzzling how they calculate their figures. Oh, anyway, there's a great altcoin. There's coin market cap, of course, but there's another one called Coin Gecko uh -huh. that has a really interesting chart. If you're into altcoins, about like they rate the coin based on community and how many blocks. You know how many blog posts? There. Yeah, yeah. We've looked at Coin Gecko uh, oh, yeah. in the past here. Well, we, we looked at Coin Market Cap for a long time, and then someone brought up the Coin Gecko uh, for alternative coins. Yeah, I think they've got a, a little bit of a more sophisticated approach yeah. to the rankings. Are you are you uh, trading in altcoins too, or a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Beginning. I've got a really important question. Sure. Is there an M two in Bitcoin? Um. Not much. No, although um, you you could argue that the bitcoins that trade off of the blockchain represent some sort of uh, some sort of M two figure possibly. If you've got a if you've got an, a coin, uh, an account on Coinbase and you don't have your private keys, but Coinbase says you've got ten bitcoins there, they could actually do some fractional reserve banking and in increase the money supply um, without people realizing, which could be an, an M two money supply. Would be impossible to measure, but yes. Yes. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting how over time you know you feel like Bitcoin's growing up, and it's uh, well possible to have some of the same problems that we thought Bitcoin was fixing. Um, Immune yeah. to. Yeah. Hey, come on in, guys. Hey, Nick. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Hey. All right. Pull up a chair. Welcome, guys. All right, so that's it on price. Any other comments on uh, on the Bitcoin price? We're up just a tiny bit, which is always fun. Um, the first news item is related to price. This one was posted by Teddy, uh, one of our main contributors in, in the group, posted this um, really fascinating analysis of the blockchain. Around 70% of Bitcoins are unspent for six months or more. And actually, this kind of mimics the, well, anecdotally, what I see amongst the Bitcoin community here in Ubud. You, whenever I ask, like, how many people in the room have Bitcoins, almost 30 raise their hand. And then I ask, how many people have spent their Bitcoins in the last week? And nobody raises their hand, right? And uh, I think that's a bit of the phenomenon we're seeing here uh, globally. Of course, the globe follows our, whatever we're doing in Ubud, that's what the, the planet does. <laughs> Where they're watching us very closely, um, but there's uh, some cool, cool. There's a cool graph here that I think is quite illustrative. Um, let's see if I get a, a larger version. Come on, internet. Okay, so this is a graph of the age of bitcoins um, uh, over the over the entire year of 2014. You can see this band right here is growing, right? It's growing ever since. Uh, January of 2014. This is where the, the price kind of spiked right up in here, and people are buying and buying. And, and apparently, um, this this is this band is growing because lots and lots of people bought when the price was much higher than today, and they are sitting on these coins uh, while probably waiting for the price to go up again. Um, so this band, this is the uh, six to twelve month band, and uh, as you know, we're we're kind of you know, a year ago is when the Bitcoin price was really on fire, right? It was it was skyrocketing. Uh, there was a, a bit of a bubble. If you look, let's see if we can see that bubble back here on the on the market cap graph. If I scrape this out a lot, you can see this is this is the the area about a year ago when uh, we were on the we we're headed towards the moon, and then up. Oh, well, maybe we won't hit the moon this time. Um, and uh, now we're over here. So everybody that bought in this area, you know, if they're still sitting on their coins between six and twelve months, all these people are, are possibly, or I guess, the conclusion of this story is that they're sitting on their bitcoins and uh, waiting, waiting for the price to move. 
Right? You can see down here, this is all the people that have had their Bitcoins for less than a day and you know, for one week. And, um, so the, the amount of Bitcoins that are actually in circulation is tiny. That's these guys. This really narrow band down at the bottom are, is what, what is circulating. You know, when I'm out in Ubud and I'm uh, taking a mic mountain biking excursion or I'm going to a restaurant, um, I'm spending my Bitcoins and, and then replacing them. Um, th this is uh, a very small amount based on the, the total market cap. All of these things, these are all Bitcoins that are very old and they represent a huge percentage of the, the total Bitcoins in existence. Yeah, I mean, it might be that, I mean, the fees on spending Bitcoins that earn a day would be very high, so that would be a reason alone that you wouldn't be moving to really easily move Bitcoins. Yeah, that could have an effect, although I think a lot of people aren't, well, I, I would guess that a lot of people aren't considering the, the, the fees when they're making decisions to spend oh, or not. It's worth saying that these are not brand new Bitcoins necessarily. These are ones that were recently transacted. So it's only the brand new Bitcoins that have higher fees. No, it's, it's when the, 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 fees go, uh, the fees go down, uh, the longer the Bitcoins have stayed in one place. And most wallets are to the account. So when you're spending Bitcoins, the wallets are to try and move the old ones. Hmm. My wallet doesn't do that. The blockchain.info wallet just just tacks on a, a fee no matter what in, in my transactions. But I'm I'm sure that there are others that that do take that into account. But really, it doesn't. You, you know, if I'm going to pay a six cent fee or not, it really it might matter if I was moving lots and lots of small amounts. Uh, and I know some some use cases uh, really are sensitive to that. But you know, even if I'm buying a, coffee, a cup of coffee, I don't really care about a six cent transaction fee. Uh, at least, at least not today. Most so. of the times, I've seen the three cent fee. But what span, Edmund, can the fee be? And I've also seen like a six cent fee and a three cent fee. Is there, well, is there any? Uh, well, there's actually a, I posted a link actually to the Bitcoins and Bali group recently. It shows a graph about what the average fee is depending on how quickly you want the transaction to, to go. It wasn't making it very clear though. How the age of the coins is factored in, so right. But but what's the span? Like, can it be more than six cents? Oh yeah. You, you can, can choose the, the default client. The, the recommendation from the clients is to have it be right now half a penny or well, three tenths of a cent. Yeah. It's it's not so much about what the fee is. It's just that the, the more you pay, the quicker it will, it will okay. be mined. You so, mean like the market of that? Yeah, the miners effectively are setting the price. Off. And the recent software, which hasn't been released yet. The Point nine, they, they, they reduced the fee to ten, in the Bitcoin QT time, they reduced the fee by a, a, by a tenth of what it was before. But it's the next version that's going to be coming out, which hasn't been released yet, where it will then learn what the market rate is based oh, on what, how quick it looks at the history of the blocks and it looks at how long transactions are taken to get mined based on their fees and it actually works out depending on how quickly you want it to be uh, included in the blockchain what fee you need to spend. That's interesting. One thing that's interesting is they, um, you know, they, they talk about the, the economics. Um, and uh, right now, the miners seem to be dependent on a, a rising price in, in Bitcoin. Essentially, uh, somewhere uh, like the, the network hashing power costs 3,000 of uh, um, hardware and electricity and and supporting the, the actual network. And most miners these days are operating at a loss with the expectation that their Bitcoins will be worth more later. Um, but uh, the, part of the analysis here is that uh, the fees will have to be exponentially higher uh, once the, the block reward goes away or as it goes away. Uh, fees will have to replace that in order to incentivize miners to participate. And uh, well, we'll just have to hope that Satoshi made a, a good decision on how that changes over time, uh, we shall see. Any other comments on this? All right. You know when the when the miners uh, like the twenty five bitcoins per block, and that's going to go down next time. Uh, it's every four years, and I don't know where we are now. Anybody know? Like maybe we're right in the middle of the four year period or something. Twenty sixteen. Did you say it costs three thousand six hundred bitcoins? A day. Let's see. Let's, let's see what it says so here. Uh, the problem with That's such low volumes is that the sheer cost of maintaining the network amounts to three thousand six hundred bitcoins every day, which effectively pays for security. 
Watson argues that the ratio of mined and processed coins, which is close to one to two, means that a massive security overkill is still taking place. So we're, we're overpaying for security because miners are thinking that the price will go up. So they're participating and trying to find coins based on the if come. 2,600 is the number of bitcoins produced every day. So it's costing what, it's, it's, that should be a one to one then. So that's a, that's a re oh yeah. So it's, maybe it's not electricity, this is the, the reward. These are the rewarded coins, is that what you're saying? Well, the coins produced per day is 3,600. So if that's what it's costing for in the network, then it's right. Well, so well, it must be. Costing the users. So he must have, the they must have calculated the cost, the cost um, of all the electricity and, and presumably they think that it's double whatever the 3,600 Bitcoins are worth, right? If he's coming up with this one to two ratio, they're, they're creating 3,600 Bitcoins, but all of the. the says the sheer cost of them. Well, I think it's from the perspective of the holders of Bitcoin. The blockchain yes, yeah. we all give them 10,600 per day in order to maintain the security of the True. network. And that's why it's over two because the price was 50% higher. There becomes this ratio. Yeah. So I don't see where the one to two is. I mean, if the cost is 3,600 per day and you're creating 3,600, well, well, well but the price was 50% higher. You see there, the 50% higher than they are today. And from there, it comes this one to two. I don't know what his logic. I didn't. Read the, uh, it yeah, be, it would be interesting for them to calculate how much electricity is going into the current network hash rate, and then figure out what the ratio what, is. What the cost actually. Well, the last time I heard about what the cost was per day, which I think was something that was produced maybe somewhere about six months ago, it was again one to one. My feeling is that it stays at around one to one cost. Yeah, generally gets the same. Which makes sense, right? Right. Well, that, that's that's the theory, but I don't know. I don't know if that's yeah, what we see in practice. Going down, or people on plugging their machines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more and more, they're moving to, to mining altcoins, but uh, yeah. still, lots of people are are not doing that as well. Anyway, th this story is saying that it costs that that uh, the miners are spending twice as much as they're earning to to uh, um, create that security. So anyway, read it for yourself, check it out. Um, and this was posted in the group, so if there's some, something more to say about it, uh, go ahead and chime in. Moving on, uh, this was posted uh, by Teddy as well. The CFTC says, we have the authority over Bitcoin price manipulation. And uh, well, the, the Commodity Futures Trading uh, Commission is also responsible for uh, um, uh, Price manipulation in every other commodities market, and it's pretty pretty widely known that commodities prices are manipulated. In fact, um, you, one could even say that the the Fed is in the business of manipulating prices because they're uh, um, they're keeping interest rates low and printing money in order to spur the economy. So they're they, that that is manipulation. They're trying to manipulate the market to act in a certain way. Um, but uh, in this case, they're they're claiming dominion, they're planting their flag on Bitcoin and saying, this is our jurisdiction and we will, uh, um, we, we will get involved in the re regulation of Bitcoin. Um, interestingly, this has an effect on not only Bitcoin, but on companies like uh, BitShares X, on, um, uh, let's see, uh, possibly Ethereum. I know that uh, counterparty companies all received a letter um, of inquiry from these guys, so um, regulation is taking place. And you know, I always kind of default like knee-jerk regulation is not good. That's kind of my default reaction. I have a a huge scam in the Doge world. Uh, Mula.io uh, took everybody for a ride and and took lots of investment dollars and uh, and somebody disappeared with the with, with the money. And um, one wonders if there was more regulation, if that would uh, discourage those kinds of things. I mean, real people lost real money in that case. Um, you know, there's a, a really no 800 number to call when that happens. And uh, you know, the, the community polices itself, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how you guys in the room feel about this kind of announcement. Um, do you feel like you need governments to keep us safe or do you feel like uh, Sorry, you, you, the current, you current government so responsible for uh, 
covering up the manipulation of the gold price and silver price, for example. So the job of the CFTC, who is pointing the flag on Bitcoin here, their job is to cover up for JP Morgan and uh, silver price suppression and things like that. So we don't trust them at all. They're working for the biggest criminals to aid in the theft. Uh -huh. So if you want regulation, it depends very much who's going to be regulating. Mm -hmm. How do you guys feel about private regulation? Because there's a, there's this concept of you know people want to have the a good housekeeping seal of approval on something, or there one could imagine that you know you would want some third party to say yes these guys are legit. In most cases, that's the government, or at least in my upbringing. I always looked to the thought I could look to the government to keep me safe, you know, make sure my tuna doesn't have uh, um, mercury in it, right? That kind of thing, which I think it does, by the way. I think yeah. it's also nuclear now, also isn't it? Like a little side of mercury. <laughs> I'll have my mercury on the side. <laughs> um, but uh, there is this concept, and the you know science fiction writers have talked about this. But I don't think it exists in reality, but. You know, if there was three different regulators that uh, were private, and in order to get their seal of approval, like for, for your company, if you wanted to offer a commodity, you could approach one of these private regulators and say, come audit my books, take a look around, you know, you have a trusted name in the, in the community, come regulate me and I'll use your, your stamp whenever you, you audit me and, and say, tell everyone it's okay. Is there a market for private regulation and could that possibly be better than the government. Yes, so I wouldn't call it private regulation. I'd call it distributed reputation systems. Yeah. Oh, okay. They say who we trust, exactly. and then we ask their opinion collectively using the right tools. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes along and says, uh, "I'll do this great deal uh, in a financial product." You can look them up according to who you trust, and who they trust, and how much they trust them. Mm -hmm. We do have a, a bit of an example in, of this in the ratings agency on, in Wall Street, right? You've got uh, Standard and & Poor's and uh, Moody's, I think. And, uh, you know, if you're an institutional investor, you know, if you're the, you know, Alabama Teachers Credit Union, like trying to manage the pension fund, you can't buy anything unless it's rated AAA by one of these private ratings agencies. But uh, that whole system fell apart in, in 2008. Or basically fell down on a job. Um, I was just thinking there's two interpretations of the word authority. It could either mean the power or right to give orders, or it could mean having power or control. So I think they might be talking about that they, that they feel that they have the right to give orders or make decisions rather than claiming that they have power or control. Uh, yes, that's good. I'm sure that's what the headline meant. <laughs> I mean, um, well, I don't. The don't the I don't. I don't know exactly what the what the distinction you're making, but I, I do believe that these guys are. Um, they they want if your company has anything to do with Bitcoin, they want information about it and uh, and want you to apply for a license if you want to do it in the United States. So. Anyway, very interesting article, interesting times we find ourselves in, and uh, well, we'll just have to see what happens. It's never dull, right? One, is the, uh, one thing that's working pretty good with the distributed um, uh, approval system is the way SSL certificates work. Yeah. Like if you have a secure website, you can choose between different, different uh, SSL providers yeah, yeah, that provide a, a certificate for your website. Uh -huh. And then the web browsers, they have a preloaded pre list with all the companies that they trust. Uh -huh. So, does this mean that they have the right to tell exchanges to liquidate their bitcoins or you know things like that? I mean, how are they going to force? I mean, other than using their own bitcoins, how are they going to manipulate the price of other people's bitcoins? Well, I mean, in in a world of uh, digital cryptocurrencies, uh, presumably there could be a company out there that's you know you think you have uh, a certain percentage of the total outstanding commodity X Y Z. And really, you they they've oversold that by by ten times, and uh, and then everybody disappears with with the money, and then you know, the, since the CFTC wasn't involved, you know, people lose money. That's the that's the argument from the regulators. Um, you know, you, they they don't want people selling commodities that don't exist or doing funny business with uh, with what they're selling to the um, to consumers. Um, so they're claiming this based on U.S. jurisdiction for U.S. people. 
Yeah, it is a, a U.S. body, a U.S. Right, government so body. So all the like FinCEN's announcements, you know, if this is an example of Mythic Plus, maybe they stole Mount Gox's money. And, you know, maybe these are all hidden admissions as to various things that I don't know. I mean, it seems seems a bit interesting. It's interesting. It, 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 it is interesting, and uh, I think we're I think we're only going to see more and more of this as time goes on. So stay tuned. Have you given much consideration as to whether Bitcoin is actually a commodity? Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? It's uh, coffee? <laughs> really? Uh, is uh, a dollar a commodity? I guess they have their own regulatory body. I don't know what the definition is of a commodity. Um, I know the IRS considers it property, and uh, I don't know what the, what the legal definition of a commodity is. Um, but. Uh, and are people aware that uh, there was traditionally, historically, two different ways of approaching money? One of which is as a commodity. It's a raw material or primary agricultural product that can be bought or sold, such as copper or coffee. Mm. And the other approach to money is something more as a debt or a promise. So you're That's not a commodity because you can't have it in your hand. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin can't do that. It's weird. Yeah. Well, I think I think you know um, we're we're in this era where we've got the car and they're still trying to regulate like horse and buggy, right? So <laughs> so you've got to have a whip in your in your in this new car thing, a whip. But uh, you know they don't understand the the difference. So I think we're we, we're we're in the gray area where regulators are trying to they're trying to to. Put a round peg in a square hole, or trying to figure out if existing laws can be applied to these new things. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's all up in the air. It really is. I think um, the Bitcoin price is visibly manipulated in the last couple of months because if you want to sell your bitcoins, nobody's going to sell you his bitcoins on the weekend and sell them in mass. You know. If you if you don't want to manipulate the price, in this case, this would be good if this happens on an exchange, a regulated exchange, and somebody sells anything in order to push the price down. This is manipulation because he doesn't do it out of commercial interest. He doesn't because he wants to influence the price for some reason or another. And this is what happens now with, with Bitcoin in the last couple of months. Somebody forcefully wants to keep the price down. We don't know why. It's obvious because he sells a lot on the weekend when it's not possible to get new fresh money to. When you messing with the so market depth and liquidity. He sells, sold a lot, then put 30,000 uh, sell wall on 300 it was. Yeah. And bits So this is a clear cut case for a regulator to say, say who? Now we don't know who is this guy who has 30,000 in bitcoins, put this wall and drove the, the price with 100 only in order to move the price down. Not because he's not interested in Bitcoin, if he wants to go out. And here it would be good to have a mani uh, regulator to come and see why do you manipulate the price. And this is my case why this would be good. But the other case is better that uh, the community just uh, polices itself. And, uh, Surely, if it's up. your ideology to try to remove trust from your currency, then you should expect lots of manipulation and you should live with it. <laughs> I tend to uh, agree, um, but uh, and well, the thing is, I think when Bitcoin becomes larger and is supporting a much larger portion of the global economy, it'll be much harder to manipulate. We're talking about a five billion dollar market, most of which, like, it's not even five billion that's pushing the price around. It's only these two bands right here at the bottom, a very tiny percentage of the overall bitcoins that's that is really determining the price of Bitcoin, and if. Anybody up in here in this area who owns all these other bitcoins, if they, if they, if the, you know, one guy owns a chunk of this blue right here and wants to move the price around, they can do it. So, and uh, so that's why it's okay maybe to get some regulation. Yeah, no. It's well, like um, the guys. Solve the problem. well, it saved us in 2008. Right. Oh. Wait, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> the problem now with Bitstamp is that you're not, it's not possible to go to Bitstamp and say, show us your books and show us who, who sold all these bitcoins, which would be possible if it was in the New York Stock Exchange. If, it's, if on the New York Stock Exchange the price fell 
by 10% in one day, they close the exchange. Which is so much more manipulation that actually happens on the stock market. Absolutely. So I'm saying the, the stock market is a good example. Yes, yeah. there's more transparency on who there is, but there's there's even more manipulation going on in that There world. is manipulation, but there are some rules which are not which are there for a reason, you know? Only so special I, people are allowed to manipulate the market. <laughs> yes. 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 Stamen, yes. this is where you send your resume when you're going to want to go yeah. work for them as a regulator. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're just giving you a hard so, time. Yeah. Well, a little more color on that 300 so long. Um, I actually know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows who it was. Um, and it wasn't market manipulation. It's actually talked to the person that was doing it. He was an early adopter who saw the price rise. He had a lot of money and then wanted out because he wanted to make sure it didn't go to zero. So it was a dumb seller. It was not. It was not a market manipulator. It gets to be very dumb. <laughs> so listen, you, want to, you have a lot of bitcoins. If you want to take the maximum value in dollars for them, are you going to sell on a Sunday? And then you you push the price to two hundred seventy-five, and then you put a rope and see uh, with thirty thousand to you show everybody. I have another thirty thousand to sell. Come he on, still has eighty percent of his holdings. No, this forget this one. It's, and so he's not overall he's trying sure. to kill the price of Bitcoin. He, he wanted his money. He, well, just, he wanted out. I thought what I thought was interesting about that whole so. thing. There was a lot of volatility in the price. There was a lot of uncertainty about the price at that time. We talked about it at the time. We showed it, and all those bitcoins were sold at three hundred. And as soon as that was done, and I think he pulled out early, even it shot right back up. To 327, and then you know we're on up to 390 now. So, uh, in a way, it was a, a statement that 300 was definitely below market. And uh, you know the you know I think we had gone down to 275 on momentum earlier than that. But when you've got when you've got some market depth, you're not going to go below 300. And that statement was made with that 300 uh, wall. Anyway, let's move on. We've only got 15 minutes yeah. left. Um, yes, let's let's move on to identity. Just real quickly, take a look at this. These stories, we'll, I'll put them in the show notes. But uh, um, the the Dutch have brought back, repatriated uh, their gold. This is a very expensive, very um, I don't know. It's very dangerous thing to do. You have to have lots of armed guards. You have to rent out uh, um, 747s. If you have to repatriate your gold, which is very heavy, by the way. From from New York to Amsterdam, you you probably have a pretty good reason to do that, and uh, Amsterdam, you know, who knows how long this gold was was in New York, but probably a hundred years or more, right? And they're asking for that gold back, and possibly, I mean, you can make up your own reasons why they would do that. Actually, I think I'll do that in the in the interest of time without too much analysis. Take a look; it's very interesting. Germany did something similar to this uh, a year or two ago and was not able to repatriate all their gold. Um, and uh, also the Swiss have a referendum coming up, I think on the 30th of November, on whether the electorate should mandate that the central bank repatriate some of their gold or maintain a 20% reserve of gold in Switzerland. But so, why do they put the gold in the US? Well, uh, during World War II, that was a good place to have your gold. Um, now maybe not so much. Um, and if you if you're confident in the paper representations of gold, then you don't go through the expense of flying all your gold home. But if you think that there's a little bit too much paper out there, maybe you want to get your hands on the physical. That's what's taking place. So does this does this show a lack of trust in the U.S. government? It shows a lack of trust in the the global uh, financial. Yeah, the, the, the global US financial. Foundation. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. the gold standard in the 70s uh, went up. When right. the UK wanted to take its uh, gold in exchange for the dollar bills, and Nixon said it's, it's not valid anymore. Yeah, but go back and watch that. There's any gold there at all. That's anymore. called the, the Nixon shock. You can go look it up on YouTube, and you know, Nixon's got the really sweaty face and everything. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah. It's really fun to watch that one. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, David Cameron. Uh, I, there's this quote here. Where it's all is about it? Us, right? Yeah, it's all about us. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he, he talks about. Let's see. 
No, nope, that's not the one I wanted to. Anyway, take a look at this too. We don't really have time to go into it, but I think it's, I'll just say this. It's interesting that uh, politicians are now out in the open saying that there is a financial crisis coming. He's appealing to, although he, that picture is, uh, is him at the G20, this story penned by him in The Guardian um, is about insulating Great Britain from the, the, the wider problems of the global financial market. Um, red lights are flashing on the global economy. And, and actually, that's why I highlighted this bit down here, because he's saying our long-term plan is backing businesses by scraping red tape, cutting taxes, build, building world-class skills, and supporting exports in, in emerging markets, or to emerging markets, which is where the, the, um, the next consumer class is rising. Um, but th this is actually, well, I don't know if he'll actually do this, but this is good rhetoric. This is what nations need to do in order to weather the coming economic storm is have real skills, real products, real things to trade with the rest of the world um, instead of a bunch of paper or, uh, or um, financial fiction. So anyway, at least uh, rhetorically, this is a, a kind of a good approach. But it's interesting that he's invoking the fact that there is a, a coming problem with the global financial system. So be sure that the people who told him to say that are looking for the price to go down so that they can buy stuff. Yes. Always. Quite possible. Some things we can never know. Okay, so let's. Uh, oh, Bitcoin Black Friday this Friday. Uh, last year it was kind of a kind of a joke, but actually they sold a lot of stuff with Bitcoin last year. That's coming up this Friday, and uh, just to uh, to to. I think it's interesting to note that places like NBC are now talking about Bitcoin Black Friday. That was not the case a year ago. So, so Black Friday is... Black Friday is the first... Yeah, it's uh, the day after Thanksgiving, which most people in the United States have off. Um, it's called Black Friday because it's, for, for many, many retailers, it's when they actually enter the... They get out of the red and into the black. They've actually made a profit for the year. Most Most U.S. companies make their make or break their business through the holiday season no no but uh, there have been stampedes so <laughs> maybe it has a dual meaning <laughs> yeah where you buy online that was kind of an Amazon thing, if I'm not mistaken, back yeah. in the day where Amazon was kind of uh, trying to capitalize on, and that was back before most people, I think, I think internet shopping eclipses actual shopping today uh, for, for the Christmas season. I could be wrong, but um, anyway, that's Cyber Monday. These are, I don't know, do these things exist in, in other parts of the world, or is that just an American thing? Yeah. yeah. Day after Christmas. Ah, uh, gotcha. Okay. Interesting. All right. Um, I will be giving the, the remainder of the Bitcoin filters for free in honor of uh, uh, Black Friday. So for the rest of the year, everything's free. Get, get in while getting's good. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about identity. Um, identity is a really interesting topic. I think... Well, um, when Bitcoin first hit the scene, uh, at least my consciousness was when it became public knowledge that people were buying drugs on the internet through Silk Road uh, with this anonymous currency called Bitcoin, right? And uh, um, you know, anonymity and the the need for anonymity is you know the the it's a philosophical debate that goes way way back, right? This paper that I've got here is from two thousand one. So you can think that you can see that they were thinking about it from an academic standpoint as early as then, and uh, it's interesting the justification they give here. This was, let's see, is there a date in two thousand one? Presumably, it's quite likely this could have been before nine eleven. Not sure. It'd be, it'd be interesting to know that. Let's see. Where does it say? Uh, well, let's look for it. Yeah, my interest in this topic out of research on the new surveillance, which includes technologies such as computer matching and profiling, video cameras, electronic location monitoring, biometric devices. This guy was pretty prescient on the things that, that we're tracking with today. I mean, this predates 
even the the idea of MySpace, much let alone Facebook. Um, but this is an academic. It's like a kind of a, a treatment on what should be studied around these things. Like uh, he enumerates the types of identity knowledge, like who are you, where are you, um, what's your reputation, etc. Um, it's also interesting down here. He talks about he enumerates the reasons why you would want to remain anonymous. You know, and, and a lot of people, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said privacy is dead, right? And a lot of people, when you talk to them about surveillance, if they're ambivalent, they'll say, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I don't care if people know who I am or what I'm doing. But there's some real interesting, uh, well, there's a real uh, interesting enumeration here of why one would want to remain anonymous. Um, you know, there was a big flap that predates the internet about the government tracking which books people take out from the library. Um, those day, that that whole flap seems kind of um, antiquated. yeah antiquated based on the, the topics we're dealing with today. Um, but take a look at this article. It's a it's a bit. I mean, uh, it's a bit wonky. It's a bit academic. But um, there's some really good stuff here. Some real food for thought on why you would want to be anonymous and also why you would want to not be anonymous. Um, a lot of people, when they talk about Bitcoin, they're excited by the fact that they, that they can't be tracked. But actually, uh, that leads me to the next story. Uh, oh, there's Zuckerberg saying privacy is over. Here's an analysis of anonymity in the, the Bitcoin system. Actually, um, if you really look at it, if you're ever able to associate someone's identity with a single Bitcoin address, you can pretty much track their entire financial life. So um, quite the antithesis of anonymity when you, when you think about it. Um, so something to be aware of, something that not everybody knows about is that you know, Bitcoin can track you down to the hundred millionth of a, of a Bitcoin, your, your financial life, if they can associate you know, one or more Bitcoin addresses with your identity. Uh, that's true. I mean, once the, once the Bitcoin is not one of us together, how would you possibly know that's the same person? Well, you, you don't always know that, but uh, if any of that change goes back to a, an address that's under your control, you can see that that's happened. Um, well, that's why, that's why you're not supposed to reuse addresses. Right. Well, but not everyone's doing that. I mean, these are the, these are the issues that people are wrestling with now, right? Um, and But there's more and more, I think, if we're going to trade with one another and we're going to um, use Bitcoin or something like Bitcoin, there's going to be no escaping associating ourselves with a, with a certain traceable address. Even if, uh, even if you're um, creating a new address every time, you can, there's still a, a trail there that a computer can, can walk and, and analyze. So this is why the government, I think, hasn't actually shut down Bitcoin actively work to shut down because they do this, they like the fact that traceable accountable you can prevent counterfeiting there's all kinds of upsides to being able to have a digital currency yes indeed in fact head of the bitcoin foundation i asked him what he thought the most number one important goal of the foundation was i don't agree with his answer because i think it should be driving the mass consumer adoption of bitcoin but his answer was actually fungibility which is this issue making it so that individual bitcoins can't be tainted based on their previous use right blacklisted so this is getting a lot of attention in san francisco uh the, there's brian vu who uh was the guy at google for the, the google guy at bitcoin he's left and this is now kind of his full time focus is coin washers and ways to make sure that if you do want to protect your privacy with bitcoin you you have all the right tools to do so. Mm -hmm. And that's to protect fungibility. Yes, it's yes. right. And fungibility, for those of you who may not know, is the interchangeability of one Bitcoin for another. Um, you know, there, presumably, if, if you could identify all of the coins that were used on Silk Road and blacklist those, then that reduces the utility of Bitcoin as a currency. So it's quite important that Bitcoin uh, maintain its fungibility and if people can associate certain bitcoins with certain activities, say a terrorist or something, and say you can't, you know, those bitcoins are no longer any good, then it really reduces the overall global utility of the of the currency. So, I mean, I don't know. 
I mean, the thing is, there's nothing to stop anyone from sending a Bitcoin to your, if you've got open address and someone chooses to send a blacklist of Bitcoin, or a Satoshi even to your address, does that mean all the Bitcoins in that address suddenly are spending? Well, well I, I don't know. I mean, these are the things that... Uh, it would make it so that that particular coin wasn't spendable, not the whole wallet, right. the whole address. Oh, I see. So if I actually did something to earn that, that, and then I couldn't spend it, that would be a problem. Is that a coin as well? Yeah. Um, one question about this. When it's a transaction is made, uh, is the IP address put into... Uh, Going into circulation with the with the with the miners, or is that only to the node that you send it to? That you I, I don't think it's not in the Bitcoin protocol itself, but I think that there are ways for people to associate IP addresses with Bitcoin transactions. If your if your node is not running on the Tor network, then there's a way to cross reference and find out where things were. Yeah, but like, uh, I mean, if I send it to if I, if I'm not on the Tor network and the node is not on the Tor network, and I send the transaction to the to the node. Then the node will know my IP address. Right. But is that node when it broadcasts the the transaction to all the other nodes? It does it include the IP address? Then? No, it's not. IP addresses are not in the protocol itself. Okay. Yeah. Because sometimes in the block itself, I think it's, it says uh, like in blockchain info, I think it says who. It's the IP address of the block uh, of the peer from which uh, blockchain does info receives the transaction. Yeah, but it's no, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, moving on. So, um, you know, the, the trick about identity and, and tracing Bitcoin transactions is associating an actual person with an actual Bitcoin number, right? The, the public address. And if you can make that connection, then you can trace everything they do. And, you know, in some instances, I want to... Um, I want to use my identity. For example, I don't want somebody else spending my coins, so I want to prove my identity. These days, I do it with the, my private key, but if someone gets my private key, they can actually impersonate me and send my bitcoins to their own address where they control the key, and they've co-opted my identity in a way and, uh, and stolen my bitcoins, which is not good. So in that way, I want to protect my identity, but um, in another way, I'd like to maintain um, financial anonymity. So, some of the um, the reasons why are enumerated in that academic paper that I posted. But say, for example, I'm Walt Disney and I'm trying to buy land in uh, in in uh, Florida to create Disney World. I, I might want to have that kind of anonymity around my financial world so that people don't gouge me on price. Right. Same thing with Apple. If they want to source a new thing from a huge factory or several factories in China. They may want to financial anonymity so that they don't uh, people don't divine what their next move is. So there are reasons for that, but th this guy obviously is on the other end of the spectrum. He's implanting uh, NFC chips under his skin so that uh, presumably he could encode his private keys in the chip in his hand and swipe his hand in order to to uh, pay for things. Actually, he's putting one chip in either hand. And uh, I don't know why Bitcoiners, all, um, some Bitcoiners just have kind of, they're just a little crazy. This guy's got this crazy handlebar mustache. Um, <laughs> not doing us any favor. No, anyway. Um, but, but the, the, you know, some people are absolutely want to associate their personhood with their address, right? That's what this guy is doing. But there's other people that, you know, want nothing to do with the, that ties them to the money that they're spending, you know, like uh, if if someone wants to hide their sexual orientation, or if uh, you know some blogger behind, uh, um, you know, in a political zone where they're not able to to have free speech, wants to receive donations or something like that. They want to keep themselves anonymous so that they can uh, keep the power of free speech. These are all reasons why you you know you don't want to associate your personhood with the with your financial resources. So it's a it's a, it's a spectrum. It's a, you know some people want the absolute ident identity and some people want no identity at all. Actually, I thought that we were going to talk how it's possible to to publicly uh, identify or link a Bitcoin address to your identity, which is in many business cases something which is needed but not possible. Well, it's it's, it's possible but not on the blockchain. 
Um, although I, I suppose you could put put something in the the notes field of a transaction, but no, for example, yeah. you want to organize something. You end it. You say, okay, I, want, I I get the donations to this address. So this is my address. Okay. Yeah, you can make that public on the blockchain. On uh, using blockchain.info, you can make a public a name for the address. How do I know that it is Andy? Maybe somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else that. goes into this is Andy. Well. But you, but you can you can prove by uh, sending a small amount from that address that you have control over the but key. But how do I know that you control this address? This is the biggest issue. Okay, okay. so I, I I give you a public address, and you say I don't know if I don't believe that you like let's say it has you know a hundred thousand bitcoins in it, yeah. and you say I don't believe that that bitcoin is controlled by you, this is, and then this I. Okay, this is nothing. You can prove your your ownership of this address. You, yeah. But imagine I don't know I don't know you. Okay, but you want to. But I don't know you. And I, I, but I want to be sure that if I send money to some address, that it is you, you know. And you can, I cannot. Not everybody can ask you to send him money, you know, to call you to write an email, send him some money so that I know this is your address. Right. Like I, I set up a website on Beyonce. Like pre-order my new album. Here's yeah, my Bitcoin yeah, address. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah. How can Beyonce say this is my Bitcoin address? You can, so you can sign anything with your private key. No, you, 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 you can sign a message. You can sign an email. You cannot know that this is Beyonce. There's. Beyonce, if Beyonce goes on yeah, you can sign website. it. You can sign it with as many keys as you like. You can sign it with a key that proves that it's that person and proves that you can spend from that Bitcoin address. How do you know that she signed it? That she it's signed it on her website. Like, yeah, this is this, this is not how they trust it. Or uh, people people this have done it. Not, but this is not because I get an idea one year ago where, for example, in the uh, 2.0 networks, you know, like Ethereum. That the broker in Bulgaria can issue his its uh, funds and sell its funds as assets. Okay, mm -hmm. so and the people can buy these assets. And it was it's a very difficult for this fund to identify that it stays behind these digital assets. You know, and the trick is to go to a notarius, notary, yes. to a notary to sign it, to put it on the page, on their web page, and so on. But it is very difficult to to make sure. To identify yourself with some others, and sometimes it's very needed. Right, Even, right. Uh, what this idea with the uh, buy story, mm -hmm. way, because I'm picking up to it. If you want to participate in the lottery, for example, how do you know that if you send this some bitcoins to some others, the viceroy is behind it, and not somebody else who pretends to be a viceroy? You know? Well, th this is this is the the question that we're discussing tonight. I mean. Do, you know, how do you identify yourself? How, how do you make the choice to identify yourself? And um, so I'm an investor in a startup called Bonafide.io that's trying to solve trust with Bitcoin by allowing you to associate your public profiles with an address. So I think of it as eBay ratings for a, a Bitcoin address. Um, if I'm going to do a transaction with somebody, I can say, this is my address. It, it, they allow you to link it to all of your social networks and your uh, Coinbase account. So you can say any of the addresses that I spend on, I'm a good person, you can even link it to eBay. So that's an interesting approach to solving this problem is start to attach who you are in real life to a specific Bitcoin address for transactions where you want to establish trust. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, you know, I'm glad that we, this has come up several times is the reputation Systems. This is this plays a role in all of our human interactions. If we were, you know, just villagers in a village trying to get along and trade, you know, if I'm going to extend credit to you, Stamen, it's based on me knowing you, knowing your capabilities, knowing your past history, um, and uh, you know, this is done informally in cultures going way, way back. Uh, now that we're on the internet, you know, I may not know you, and so how do we establish those age-old Reputation, reputational systems. That's also tied to identity, and it's a it's a whole academic study area in itself, right? eBay, I think, relied on its success for the reputation systems. Uh, Reddit, you know, the things that bubble up to the front page of Reddit are based on people's upvotes and downvotes. It's also a reputation system, also responsible for their success. Um, so again, the use of identity and the utility of identity, uh, I think, is crucial. To some use cases, um, including these reputation systems and Amazon trade. Amazon as well, right? Yeah. By purchase. Right. Uh, 
this person has uh, floated the idea of a, of a crypto passport using the blockchains. It's, it's the same type of story. It's the same. It's similar to what uh, your friend is doing with uh, identity, trying to associate uh, identity with, uh, with a cryptographic key and then um, establishing reputation around a, a provable identity. In this case, he's applied it to passports. Um, and he says he doesn't doesn't think that uh, nation states will will adopt this for their own passport mechanism, um, but they could. And actually, you could have a passport for other things. You know, if if you want to prove your identity in a certain context, um, you could use this um, this uh, conventions based passport uh, mechanism to do it. It's an identity card more than a passport. It's a, yeah, it's more of an identity card. It's a way to, to prove you are who you are, so that you can um, you can build a reputation and and pass through somewhere based on the fact that you are that person. In Estonia, everybody gets a chip in this identity card. Yeah, chip and pin. Yeah, they get a chip. You insert it to your computer. Everything is electronic, so you can sell all the property you have uh, with this. Mm -hmm. But it's a it, it's a it might use cryptography, but presumably it's a centralized government uh, yes, ID yes. system. Yeah. Interesting. What else do we have here? Oh, um, you know, we're talking about identity and and what we give away or don't give away, and um, this is actually uh, information that I give away to Google. This is uh, where I've been over the last let's see one day. Um, Google tracks my identity based on my phone, right? So you know it's it's creating a profile of me. It's, it identifies me, maybe not by name, but by you know my login and where I am with my phone. And if I look here, I can go 30 days out. You can see what a homebody I am. How I never leave Ubud. Let's see here. Come on, baby. There, there's there's me for 30 days. Not very interesting, is it? I spent a lot of time on Hanuman. Look at that. Um, there's the Viceroy out there. Um, but it's it's kind of interesting that, that Google has this information. They associate it with me. They probably sell it to advertisers. Um, they're they're building, they're associating my person, or at least the person that has my phone, um, with with this data. And they you know I. This is the price we pay for, you know, uh, a nice Google phone, all the software that runs there. And but what do you think blockchain got 50 million in seed funds? Blockchain new money. Yeah. When they 30 million, yeah. And they can preserve What do you think? You think that they're analyzing our... Of course. Yeah. They're going to sell all this information. What can we do about it, Stamen? What should we do? Yeah, blockchain got new money. Yeah. <laughs> The NSA just knows pretty much where you are any time of day. Yeah, I, I'm hoping that this can get me out of a murder conviction at some point. <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't there. It wasn't me. Yeah. yeah we but need them. somehow they're always switched off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if I'm being framed. Well, I could be framed by Google. You could put me here at my mistress' house. Right here. I turn my phone off when I go over there. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, there is a site for data group where you can input all your data and uh, they sell it for you and you get uh, published. Right. Well, that's, that, that's what people are talking about, these kind of business models where there's more of an explicit, you know, yes, I want to share my information with Adidas and, and they'll pay me a, a few pennies or... I think that's. I think that's the direction we're heading. As more and more people realize the deal they're making for all these free services, then it will it will shift. But for Mark Zuckerberg make that statement like he doesn't use Facebook at all. You know, he actually deleted a lot of the stuff that he originally posted on it. So you know, it's kind of in my eyes contradictory for him to like, oh yeah, you guys use the service, give us all the info, but you know, I'm not gonna have anything of it. Like. I'm going to protect my own info. If, if you look on the internet, there's a really interesting, he, he got in a lot of hot water around his privacy uh, policy back in 2009, and he was at some conference where he was confronted on it, and he was all, all sweating, and he had to take his, he took his hoodie off, and <laughs> anyway, you can, you can find that if you search for it, but it's a, it's a tricky problem because, you know, people love Facebook. Facebook is free because they have that information to share. If he asked Facebook users to pay for it, they'd probably turn it off and it'd be less useful. It's kind of a hard problem, you know? I guess my point more so is that, like, 
I would expect the government, or I would expect Mark Zuckerberg in this case, to you know be the leading example of transparency if that's what they would expect from everyone else. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So funny, sorry for you, Bon. Um, it was about, I want to say three, four, maybe five years ago, a guy named Sammy Kempkar actually did the reverse engineering of the iPhone and Android to discover that all of this data was being broadcast to, to Google and, and through both of those platforms. Um, uh, he's actually a friend of mine, and before he exploited it, he thought about using it for a different, or before he announced it, he thought about using it for himself. He had an app built called Clear My Route where the reason why Google was doing this was to broadcast information and provide traffic directions. So what he was going to do was it put allow people to put in an address that they wanted to go to and then have it broadcast that that was a really slow route. <laughs> so that so everyone got, else would be all green lights. Yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't actually build it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Anyway, please erase this from your own memory, where I've been for the last uh, 30 days. Thank you very much. Um, speaking of Apple, uh, there's a, a huge uptick in, finger, in the fingerprint sensor market, which presumably is going to go on all kinds of Android phones, already going on the latest version of the Apple phones. Um, this is a way for the person with the phone to prove that they are who they are, so they can use this new Apple Pay. and. Uh, you know, there presumably there will be other uses to for phone users to identify themselves to the phone and authorize things. Um, for the phone to deny access to the user. Yes. 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 Have you guys seen a movie called Enemy of the State? Yeah. Right. I think it came out in like 1998, or it was it predates all of this stuff. But uh, you know, Will Smith is is framed for some crime, and all of a sudden, like nothing works. Like his bank accounts are empty, and his credit cards don't work, and it, it's uh, Pretty fascinating. Um, you know, these days, I think there's there's instances where people disable a car cars remotely, and uh, you know everything's got a computer in it. There's there's this whole concept of the Internet of Things, which uh, in in most cases will will be great and convenient, but in um, a post Orwellian apocalypse, maybe it will be used against us. You know, our our baseball hat with an internet connection will you know squeeze our head until it explodes. Something like that. I don't know. Um, but uh, yes, we at least we're we're going into this with our eyes wide open. We've got 16, 17 people here who who know the story, and you know <laughs> we'll just keep on trucking. <laughs> All right. Um, another way that people are identifying individual people, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto wanted his anim anonymity. Right, he he went to great lengths to preserve his anonymity, and we don't really know who it is. But actually, there's some pretty good analysis and and um, things that point to a, a certain person. One of the things they used was um, this uh, algorithmic handwriting analysis, right, where they're actually going in and looking at all of his writing and comparing to known authors in the cryptography space, and the economic space, and the um, uh, intellectual space. You know, they, it can do things like uh, score things based on how you spell certain words. Like, there's a British spelling versus an American spelling. There's um, there's use of unusual words, or, or certain authors use certain unusual words more than others, and so it can point to identity. I think they've done this kind of analysis on Shakespeare because no one really knows who Shakespeare is, and they think that it's it was a series of people, but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe privacy is dead. If you can't even write something and be anonymous, you know, are we? Are we? Is everybody going to know everything about everybody? You know, are we even? Are we going to have bathroom doors anymore? I don't know. Remains to be seen. So one real interesting piece of this is that he took that analysis and then ran it against the whole internet and actually came out with Nick Zabo as the guy. It wasn't that they just had a field of people, and then Nick was the highest scoring one. So Nick, Nick is actually the most likely person on the internet to have written the Satoshi Nakamoto paper the according to this analysis. No, he's well-known. Yeah. No, he's not well-known. Who's Nick Sabo? you never heard of him? I, I've heard of him. Everybody well, knows But him. he's a real person. Show me a picture of him. I came from my phone and my phone. Gary Farm, there's one guy who who uh, offers so much information about this. I think it actually says in this article that he's a 
person at the George Washington University? No, you go in Washington University, the Washington University said they never get such a person. This is a story. Oh, he, he's fictional? Nick Sabo is a pseudonym? Yeah, but really? Oh, yeah. Wow, the but plot no, thickens. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there's a picture of him right here. That's him right there. <laughs> so there's at least one reason to remain anonymous, and, and he seems to have pulled it off, maybe. maybe another not. interesting question, though, is, is did he just write the white paper, or did he write the protocol? You know, you yeah. Well, a lot of people think he had help with the programming, but you'd have to have, you'd have to be quite a polyglot to have pulled off the, for one person to have pulled off the Bitcoin uh, reference implementation. Oh. All right, we're gonna wrap things up here, guys. There's a, a few more articles here about uh, well, facial recognition software. Again, we're just tying individual people to their identities, and there's all kinds of ways that can happen. There's this one scene in Minority Report, and it's a science fiction movie, um, where the main character is walking through the mall and it's like, hello, Nick Anderson, how are those underwear working out for you that you bought last time? You know, um, so anyway, I think... A similar thing is happening in Sweden, like when you drive into a shopping mall, uh, the, there's a camera that reads your registration case and checks on the value of your car, and then it displays the ads uh, based on the value of your car. So. Oh, really? So if it's a Mercedes and they show you like... Uh... I don't know, poodle, poodle clothes, and if, it, <laughs> and if it's a Datsun, they show you, like, car repair. Um, interesting. Um, I'll just leave you with this. There's a fascinating philosophical discussion of identity on Let's Talk Bitcoin, number 160. Um, check it out. It's uh, Andreas Antonopoulos um, talking with, I think, the, the guy from Feathercoin, or maybe one of the early Litecoin guys. Really smart guy, really interesting conversation. If you're into the philosophy of, of it all, uh, check it out. Feathercoin? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Griff. Um, that's it. We're a little over time, so we're going to wrap it up. Any final thoughts, final announcements, final things to say from the gallery? Tipping Tuesday. Tipping Tuesday. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, what? Yeah, yeah, what's what's, what's tipping? I don't know what that is. Oh, really? I should know. Yeah, tell me. So it's actually come up with by Victoria, who I thought she was going to be here. She'll be here a little bit. But just this idea of creating a weekly event around tipping, getting everybody excited. They go on little missions. So this week it'll be a certain mission. Next week there'll be a different one. And it has to do with driving the mass consumer adoption of Bitcoin, getting more and more people excited about it. So they run around on... Twitter, Reddit, all the platforms that we're supported on, and do big giveaways. So, for those of you who are online, we've got the folks from Change Tip with us. Change Tip, I think, is the preeminent uh, tipping mechanism for Bitcoin on the sites that you mentioned. Uh, Twitter, Reddit, where else? GitHub, YouTube, Google Plus, Tumblr. Yeah, Sorry, like friends. totally uh, amazing recent activity around tipping. Great for uh, Bitcoin. In general, I think the whole tipping phenomenon, people showing their generosity, people showing that value can be exchanged for interesting tweets or valuable um, submissions on GitHub or, or Reddit, I think it's a fantastic concept that I, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. It's really uh, exciting to have you guys here with us, actually. And did you choose Tuesday because we have this meeting on Tuesday? Is that why, <laughs> is that why tipping? No? Is it because tipping starts with a T? <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> that, that's, that's all the time we've got, guys. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, we're signing off from Bali. Thanks to you guys online for tuning in, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thanks, guys. Thank you.